last closing note. <laughs> Um, we are very happy that Susan is giving this closing note. See, she's in, uh, sitting in New York, so for maybe for Susan it's a bit too early for a beer, so <laughs> she's drinking her coffee. <laughs> um, Susan McGregor was um, a keynote speaker at the Euro S&P 2021 conference, a conference that we at SBA Research organized, and we loved her talk, so we asked her to give a talk here at SEC for Death again. Um, she co-chairs the Center for Data, Media and Society at the Columbia University's Data Science Institute in New York. Her research is mainly centered on security and privacy issues affecting journalists and media organizations. She authored two books, one about information security essentials and one about data wrangling and data quality in Python. And today she will explore the practical implications of considering the aftermath of a security incident during the software development process. So please welcome with me Susan McGregor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, uh, as mentioned, uh, I gave a, a talk kind of on a similar theme about a year ago. Um, and in the interim, I've had the chance to talk with more software developers about kind of, um, and, and look at more work around software development and security, um, and so I, I want to offer that this talk is, is sort of a, a big idea. Uh-oh, freezing. Uh, <laughs> it's meant to be sort of a big idea. Um, and I hope that maybe we'll have some time for questions or comments from you all afterwards, um, since most of you are uh, doing the very difficult work of translating uh, things like academic research security ideas um, into practical applications. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit about me. Um, so my background is actually as a as a web developer, as a as a programmer. Um, I started out after graduating from university. I worked for startups doing um, mostly front end web development. Um, I then moved into journalism. I was a senior programmer on the news graphics team at the Wall Street Journal for several years. Um, I developed the first real-time election coverage that they did. Um, and from there, I moved on to Columbia University where I spent many years as a faculty member at the School of Journalism um, and more recently became a full-time researcher in the Data Science Institute. Um, and since I joined Columbia um, uh, is where my sort of deeper security work started. Um, I was involved in a series at the Wall Street Journal um, that was called the What They Know series, which was kind of an early, um, popular investigation into web trackers um, and uh, became aware as I moved over to Columbia full time, um, just uh, the many challenges that um, network technologies were posing for the security and privacy of, of journalists work and media organizations. Um, since joining Columbia, in addition to doing that security research, um, you know, I've moved more kind of into the data science data analysis space. Um, as mentioned, I have two books that came out in 2021 that kind of reflect these two things. So the Information Security Essentials book with Columbia University Press is really a, a guide for reporters and news organizations thinking about security in, in a practical way. Um, some high level ideas and also kind of scenario based um, uh, strategies for thinking about information security. Um, and on the flip side, I have the Python book, which is the language that I've been working in mostly doing data science, um, which is really kind of like a zero to data science, like data analysis book. Um, and what I think is interesting about it is that in the academic space, as many of you know, um, you know, data is increasingly a part of the information security um, concept, right? So, it, it, to me, it's interesting that these two things still kind of intersect because um, when we think about information security uh, for applications, we're also often thinking about things like data integrity and stuff like that. So, you know, 
uh, as I said, I'm not an expert in kind of what's happening in um, in information security from an engineering perspective these days. Um, but, you know, the way that I think about, so I, again, I'll welcome kind of input on this um, at the end of the talk, but, you know, I sort of think about the key things that we think about when we think about information security. And, and part of this is on the sort of stand, what I think of as a sort of standard access control and authorization, right? So we have authentication patterns that we think about, um, you know, login, password recovery roles, um, how we protect data, encryption, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, from the sort of organizational side, when we're worried about log forging, data corruption, um, depending on the region that you're in, right, deletion may play a role in this. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I, I think is more of a feature, certainly is more of a feature in the European Union than it is currently in the United States, where I'm based, um, is issues around data privacy, deletion, kind of individual rights around data integrity and data privacy um, that obviously have big implications for, um, for curating and managing data within an organization. Um, and the work that I've been doing in the last few years, um, you know, shifted away kind of from uh, this top area, the authentication, encryption, data protection stuff to what has become a bigger security risk in the communities that I work with most, which is journalists and media organizations. Um, because, you know, 10 years ago or so, what most media organizations in the United States were worried about was essentially government spying. They were worried that, um, you know, our national security agency was tracking their communications, um, things like that. They were. <laughs> um, but uh, what was interesting for me is as I was working on my book and I went to talk to the people handling security at major news organizations, international news organizations, um, what they told me was that actually the biggest problem they were facing was um, was harassment and doxing um, in particular, and that the kind of security risk attendant in many of the um, that resulted from a lot of sort of like data privacy loss was actually the thing that was causing the most difficulty for their for their people. So over the last couple of years, um, you know, writing the book helped because I got to kind of encapsulate some of the essential knowledge um, for basic information security practices, which were not well known necessarily within the journalism community. And I got to kind of put those in the book um, and then move on to thinking about um, things like harassment and doxing um, that really pose a serious security risk um, to a lot of people now, journalists being one community, but um, certainly not the only one that is affected by this. Um, and, and over the past couple of years, it's, it's kind of made me think that um, maybe we need to broaden what we think about when we think about security um, and, and maybe shift some strategies to respond to the fact that um, there are these new and pretty severe risks. So this is kind of my, I, my meme game is very weak, um, <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is, this is to me kind of like the two sides of the coin with security, right? We're always out here telling people that security is important. They have to do all these things. You know, you've got to have MFA. You've got to use password managers. You've got to, um, you know, do this and that. Um, but also we're very clear about the fact that, you know, there isn't such a thing as perfect security, right? There are going to be failures. There are going to be breaches. No security is perfect. Um, you know, that's okay because when things go wrong, you know, we know exactly what to do, which is basically this, <laughs> you know, right now, I think a lot of what happens is there's a security breach, there's a failure of some kind. Um, and while we might have a fix for, um, what we consider the underlying technical problem, right? There's a, you know, there's an update, we patch it. There's a missing security certificate, we upgrade it, whatever. Um, what that doesn't take into account is all of the downstream effects um, that that security breach can have. Um, and so my view is that knowing that these things are going to happen uh, and that they are going to have big downstream effects, um, both for our organizations, right? And their role in the world, um, and their, you know, business operations and reputation and for the actual people, right, who are often dealing with the fallout of, say, 
a data breach that reveals their private information, um, that we should be thinking about those consequences of a security failure um, in our thinking about designing security solutions, technologies, et cetera. So my, the, the argument that I'm making here basically is for what I'm currently calling fully scoped security. Um, and I think that number one here is kind of the key point, which is that recognizing that security is both about prevention, um, right? Reducing risk, preventing data loss, preventing data corruption, um, you know, all of that. Um, but that it's also about recovery. Um, interestingly, in, you know, and I think an example of this, I'm using a different one, but when I was talking to some developers before this talk, you know, the thing that kept coming up was, was the Okta situation from this year um, and thinking about like how that was handled. Um, and I haven't delved into it too deeply, but it seems like in the end, the actual scope of the breach was not so enormous. Um, but there were a lot of issues with the way that it was handled, the communications around it and things like that. And those things do matter. Um, and again, they matter, especially because if you're in a situation where your product or your company um, is handling a lot of user information and depending on customers, right? Most of us are working in organizations that depend on customers in some way, then it's not just what happened, it's how the response to that is handled. Um, and so again, taking a broader view of security as you know, securing operations and businesses, right? Thinking about like business continuity. Um, I would say that security needs to not just be prevention, but also think about how to facilitate recovery um, to minimize harm, right? We think a lot about minimizing risk, but also think about minimizing harm. The second and third, I think, are kind of just a, a reminder for those of us who are in the business of usually encouraging other people to think about security when maybe they don't want to, um, which is to say that even if a security failure isn't our fault, it's often still our problem, right? So it may be that, you know, a security failure happens because another team didn't upgrade, um, you know, a particular framework to the latest version because they needed some feature that wasn't supported or they didn't have the resources to make the changes needed to do the upgrade. And that it doesn't really matter in the end, right? I mean, at the end of the day, all of us are living with the consequences of a security failure, whether or not we can trace it back to um, a particular choice on our project or our team um, that led to that, that situation, right? So um, we can, uh, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it can be narrowed down to a particular thing that should have happened differently. Um, but realistically, we all have a stake in improving the situation. Um, and then the third one, and I know sometimes this is hard, at least it is for me, um, is really trying to engage rather than blame stakeholders, right? So, um, you know, the fact is that that the source of that security breach may have been a phishing email, right? Somebody, a, a person doing something that they weren't supposed to do. Um, but if we want to see improvement, if we want to see change, um, we, you know, it is in our favor also to think about ways to engage stakeholders um, uh, constructively um, so that we can hopefully inspire them to take on some of the, um, the thinking work and the responsibility in creating a more secure general operational environment. Um, so how do we actually do this stuff? <laughs> um, I don't think, you know, I, again, I'm not going to present anything here that is um, sort of a, a an ABC of these are exactly the things that you should do. Um, again, over the past couple of years, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been looking at uh, recovery, especially from things like like harassment and doxing. And I think it's actually, that research is really, really interesting for thinking about the translation to a software development context and kind of a, a business operations context. Um, but I can't claim these are fully tested ideas. Again, I'm, I'm very interested to hear from you all um, sort of what your thoughts and, and reflections are on these, on these concepts. Um, so again, you know, when we think about kind of existing security measures for prevention and minimizing risk, typically I think of access control, authentication, roles, encryption, um, static analysis of code, secrets management, 
you know, technology specific best practices, right? Am I using, you know, the best way of accessing this content or scripting this particular feature um, so that I don't create vulnerabilities, um, you know, particularly to certain types of attacks. What I would say is that we want to add to this toolkit some additional measures, most of which on the surface, I think, appear to be about data, and they are <laughs> um, for the most part, um, with different degrees of kind of complexity and difficulty and, and maybe applicability, depending on the space you're working in. Um, and again, you know, emphasizing that I think, unfortunately, one of, you know, the challenge with software development is that it's highly specialized and complex. And, and so um, there often isn't overlap where someone may not be coming to you um, if you're working on security issues to say, what should we be doing about our data collection, right? Um, so this is not to say that this becomes, you know, your responsibility if you're doing this, but um, thinking about how to engage these things uh, where you have the opportunity, I think is, is still really valuable. So data minimization, I'm sure is fairly familiar to everyone in the room. Um, I'm actually working on a project um, uh, with some colleagues right now that addresses this from the research side. So in, you know, sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning research, those are really data hungry disciplines, right? Everyone wants more data, more granular data, more specific data. Um, but the fact is that a lot of times when we are collecting that data, um, we're collecting more than we need. That again itself creates a security risk. So, you know, data minimization, like a really basic example, is uh, for research. We need to understand if we're conducting a survey, for example, we want some basic demographic information about the people that we're speaking to, so we understand if our research findings generalize um, to a certain population. Um, if we don't think about it, right? We might go, okay, well, we ask everyone their birth date. But if what we really want to know is sort of, but but oftentimes that's actually more than we need to know, right? Maybe we really just need to know their age or we need to know what age range they're in because we want to know how, um, you know, how their attitudes or experiences relate to their particular cohort. So thinking about data minimization and are we really collecting the things that we need? Are we collecting more than we need um, can be, you know, a powerful thing for just ensuring that if a breach does happen, right, then the um, the risk associated with the data exposed is lower. Um, De-identification is another way to approach this. Um, again, as many of you probably know, uh, de-identification de is complicated. Um, you know, if you take something like the General Data Protection Regulation and its view of what constitutes personal information, it's pretty much anything. Um, and that's why at times a, a more complex um, approach like thinking about differentially private and synthetic data construction can be really valuable. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where uh, you're relying on uh, data to drive business insights, to drive product innovation, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, you want to retain that granularity a lot of times. That's where something like synthetic data can be really valuable. Um, and that reduces your risk on two fronts, right? Because it reduces the material risk to um, the to the people whose information you have, um, because you're not really storing that anymore. Also, it reduces your legal liability risk, right? Because if it's not data about real people, um, then it isn't subject to the same protection requirements um, and the chances that your organization kind of gets hit for um, uh, certain kind of, you know, legal responsibilities, again, under something like the GDPR, or if you're in a region that has similar privacy legislation, is going to be a lot lower. Um, the other thing that I think, um, so I gave a talk a, a little while back at the um, Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium in the sort of hot pets, like hot topics section, um, where I, I brought up the issue of deletion um, and like as something that like we kind of can't do with computers in a, in a modern sense, um, not very effectively, um, which, you know, the longer I'm in this, the more of a problem I think that actually is. Um, but another thing is just thinking about, and this is a strategy that I, I use a lot when I'm talking with 
journalists and media organizations, it's just thinking about getting things offline. Um, I was talking with a developer recently uh, who works at a large company and they found dozens of terabytes of um, image backups, you know, of, of backed up data on a server somewhere. And they were paying hundreds of dollars a month to maintain it. And it's like, you really don't need that online. <laughs> The chances that you're going to go back, I mean, in this case, like the chances that they were going to go back to review or use those backups that were in some cases, I don't know, 12 or 15 months old, um, they really didn't need to be sitting on a web server fully available at any time um, to serve what even their potential intended purpose would be for that company, right? So that's another aspect where just thinking about getting things offline, even if they're not publicly accessible, Again, the, the sort of threat model here is like, what happens when something goes wrong? Um, and if something goes wrong, how can we make sure that what gets exposed in that process um, is, is the lowest risk possible, obviously without compromising um, sort of our, our day-to-day -day business needs. Um, so, uh, oops, I missed one. So, I mentioned that the other part of this to me, another big part of this is thinking about recovery. What happens after there is a breach? Um, in the work that I've been doing in the last year or so in particular, I've been looking a lot at disaster recovery. Um, so what happens um, to people <laughs> um, after they experience a traumatic event, flood, hurricane, earthquake, uh, nuclear plant meltdown, terrorist attacks, all of these things. And what's really fascinating about it actually is that all of the research, and it goes back, the, you know, work in this space goes back to sort of the middle of the 20th century, um, is that the negative impact that people experience because of a traumatic event is shaped more by what happens afterwards than by the event itself. The way that that they are engaged or responded to, usually in the sort of immediate aftermath of something terrible happening to or near them, um, is really about the response, not the severity of or the, the apparent external severity of what they went through. And so when we think about planning for recovery, it's thinking about what is the experience going to be for the organization, maybe for customers and users that we can expect, reasonably expect in the event of a security failure? And are we prepared to take the steps necessary to minimize the harm, right? So again, to me here, the sort of parallel is a lot of, we already think a lot about minimizing risk. I think there's ways we could think about it more and more cohesively, um, but also think about minimizing harm. And it turns out that we have a lot of tools for minimizing harm that we can employ even if something bad happens and that those tools are actually very, very effective. Um, so this isn't sort of a like, let's put a, you know, a Band-Aid on a tear, you know, on an open wound here. It, it actually makes a really big difference. Um, so this is not an official list from like uh, an existing handbook. This is what I've I've sort of synthesized that I think is most relevant to, that I think is most relevant to this space, um, but basically kind of three steps, right? Notification, assistance and remediation and redress. Um, and of course, like anything with security, it only works if you evaluate it and test it in advance. You don't wanna be trying these things out, um, you know, only, <laughs> only in real time. Um, and I would say again that like this is not so different from a typical business operations um, disaster recovery scenario. It's just thinking about that um, with the idea of a security failure of different flavors in mind and how those might be handled. Um, so to kind of illustrate this, um, I'm going to use a very uh, an excellent counterexample, which is to say a situation where all of this was done wrong. Um, this is a um, this is a US sort of specific example. I'll share details as it seems useful as we go through. Um, you might be familiar with it, um, but Equifax in the United States, it is legal for companies to collect, um, to 
to collect and collate public information about individuals. Um, they can generally package and resell this information. Um, they can also purchase it from other parties. Um, and a key area of economic activity where that happens is in our credit system. So there are a few major organizations that compile, that create profiles of people um, based partly on their financial and other histories. And that is used to make financial institutions use that to make determinations about whether to offer people loans, et cetera, et cetera. So there's three major credit reporting agencies. In 2017, Equifax, which was one of these agencies, um, uh, notified the public essentially of a major breach that had exposed the information, um, including personal information of 147 million Americans. Um, and I will point out that in the United States, again, right now, what, quali what qualifies as personally identifiable information is a very limited number of data points. Um, it's really our a social security number, um, a few other things, including say credit card numbers, it kind of falls into that. So when they say 147 million Americans personal information, it's not even just like address, you know, birth date, et cetera. Um, it's really things that can be used to impersonate you, et cetera, et cetera. So Equifax did pretty much everything wrong. Um, and uh, it's kind of shocking that this happened this way, but it really shows how um, important it can be to get it right. So the first thing is notification. Um, again, I don't know if this was on uh, the radar of anyone in the room, but one of the first things that happened was um, after sort of the news broke that Equifax had had this breach and they said it's, you know, on over 100 million people. Um, not that 100 million people, the, the, it was not everyone that they had information on. And so the first thing that most people naturally wanted to do is to find out if they had been affected. Well, it turns out that Equifax did not maintain and somehow could not create um, a web form on their existing domain that could handle the traffic, the web traffic, literally people going to a website um, that was required um, to perform this action, right? So what they did was they created a new domain. Um, this tweet, this is a real tweet <laughs> that was sent out by the actual Equifax account um, referring people to this custom domain where they were supposed to go and input, again, some pretty revealing information, social security number, which is sort of isn't supposed to be, but still functions as a national ID number in the United States, um, you know, to find out if their information had been affected. Well, the trick here is that actually this URL, securityequifax2017.com, was not the domain that Equifax had created. Um, they had created a domain called Equifax Security, 2017.com. This URL was actually, this domain was actually registered um, by a white hat hacker who was trying to make and did very successfully make the point that by not having this notification form on their own domain, uh, Equifax was creating a whole new universe of security risk for its users. Uh, <laughs> it's not even right to call them customers because no one actually voluntarily as part of this database. Um, uh, Equifax just didn't have the resources to handle this, right? So they knew that they had data on hundreds of millions of Americans, but they had never thought, how will we be prepared to let people check or let people know if there is an issue? Um, lots of hilarity ensued. Um, this, <laughs> this domain is still registered. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with it. But the point is, is that just thinking about that, of our customers, of our users, how, what means do we have to notify them if there's a problem? Um, can we support that in our current configuration? Do we have those resources available and or ready to spin up um, if a bad thing should happen? So this, hack, this breach happens, lots of people have their information exposed. Um, lots of people, depending on their situation, immediately see attacks, you know, basically see people trying to open credit cards in their name, open bank accounts in their names. Equifax, perhaps not surprisingly, um, because they are in the business of, of um, 
credit monitor their their credit reporting agency also offer credit monitoring tools. And so their approach to assistance here is to say, well, don't worry, we're going to give you a free year of our trusted ID premiere, this product that is supposed to monitor your um, financial credit and alert you to any problems and help you fix them. Doesn't actually, didn't actually do that. At the time that they were offering this protection, um, they didn't even have MFA <laughs> on the service that they were offering. So now their approach to assistance or remediating this harm, right, which the potential among the possibilities of fallout is that other, you know, that fraudsters are going to uh, try to open up credit accounts, savings accounts, et cetera, in your name, try to access your existing accounts, all of that, because now they have the identifying information to do so, um, passwords, usernames, again, uh, personal information that's otherwise meant to be secret. Um, and this is their solution. Uh, deeply unsatisfying. Um, you can see even, uh, you know, very quickly, you know, I mean, experts were already saying this is the wrong solution um, because it wasn't the, the thing that they were trying to offer as a means of assistance was actually, again, probably going to make the issue worse, right? So thinking about what one what one would want to do, right, is to say, well, what's the impact of this going to be? If you are working as a, you know, a shipping or a delivery company, right, what is the impact, what is the business impact going to be for your customers if there is a breach, if there is a breakdown in your service? Um, I was thinking about this, that actually uh, what feels like a really good model for this um, is something I don't think exists anymore, but, you know, 25 years ago, if you bought a plane ticket and your flight was canceled for some reason, your airline would rebook you on other flights to get to your destination. Even if it meant that you were flying with a competitor, they would get you on a plane to try to get you where you were going, right? So that I think to me is the model is what is the harm that your users, your customers have experienced and how can you reduce the impact of that harm, whatever that disruption um, or harm might be. Um, redress, uh, which is like remediation, but not quite, um, which is essentially compensation, right? There's going to be some fallout, even if you do a really, if you do a really excellent job with assistance and remediation to the point where my business isn't really impacted because you have thought about the problem in advance and solved it for me, you might not even have to worry about redress, right? Um, but it's still something worth thinking about because you can't, you know, you can't plan for everything. Um, in this case, the approach to redress was after a huge settlement, you know, after a very long term government action, um, five years now, <laughs> later, uh, people are still filing for these things. Um, I was also thinking about how, um, how that is, how that is made available. Um, you know, it, it might look like a good number to say that you can you can get up to twenty thousand dollars from Equifax in redress. Um, the reality is that to get back even basic costs requires such an enormous amount of documentation um, that, and I'm sure they don't mind this. Probably a lot of people aren't even going to bother to do it, right? Um, but if you're going to do this, oh, and I also just have to point out that they have another excellent uh, separate domain. <laughs> on which they're hosting this information, like they didn't learn it the first time. Um, in any case, thinking about what that's going to look like and how that um, and how you're going to, to distribute that um, is another thing worth considering. Because again, taken together, these are the kinds of steps that help minimize the harm that happens when, when something goes wrong and something is going to go wrong at some point. So engaging stakeholders, um, this is a tricky one. Uh, and again, this is this is really taken from my experience um, working in the journalism community and talking to people um, mostly who have not thought about security at all, um, right? And have kind of just nothing bad has happened yet. They don't, so they have no reason to think about it. They have um, a lot of a lot of other things that are that feel like business priorities, right? That feel more important. Um, 
I'm not suggesting that if your primary role is as a software developer or engineer that you, um, you know, start tracking people down to say, you know, what about this? What about that? You should, you know, you need these solutions. Um, over the years, also as an educator, I've found that asking questions is a really powerful um, is a really powerful thing. And I don't mean to ask these um, in a in a gotcha kind of way, right? Genuinely inquiring of people and saying, you know, how do you want to be able to access this data? How often do you want to make an offline backup? How often should it be overwritten? How do you want to handle data deletion requests? All of these things by asking the question, you help them consider those options. You don't need to have an answer. They don't need to have an answer, right? But this is a way to start introducing some of these concepts and ideas um, into into some of the processes that may not be strictly within your domain, right? Some of them may be, right? If you are responsible for uh, a piece of a software application that's, you know, taking in user data and validating it and storing it, you know, it's a reasonable question to ask. You know, many of these are reasonable questions to ask. Um, and by thinking about them that way and by raising these questions with stakeholders, inviting them to consider them, um, you can help, you um, start a broader conversation, right? About maybe what is the purpose of the data that's being collected or being retained. Um, yeah, so I think the other thing that, um, and this is more, I think, this is somewhat more relevant um, for folks who are working in, in freelance situations, um, but, you know, uh, I again, I mostly in journalism and media organizations. And it's a very typical pattern that a media organization that starts out small, um, among other things, they'll, they'll build a website, right? That's what they do. They publish content, they build a website. Um, and it's not until things go big, right? All of a sudden they write an article that gets a lot of attention that they also draw the attention of bad actors who are going to exploit security vulnerabilities that they have. But of course, these are not people who are security experts. They're not technology experts of any kind. Um, and more often than not, what has happened is they've hired somebody they, you know, on a project basis for a set fee who builds them a website. And then that person goes away. And two years later, right, all kinds of things are out of date. They're unpatched, et cetera, et cetera. And they're incredibly vulnerable, even if they don't realize it. So I think in any situation, um, there's a, an excellent um, author. He's actually a doctor named Atul Gawande, who actually wrote an entire book about checklists and why they're so important um, in the medical field for preventing harm. But also, you know, it can extend really into, I think, any sort of preventative prevention, risk prevention um, and, and harm reduction strategy is just give people some tools for thinking about these things. You know, if you're working on a project and you know, you know, the security certificate is going to expire at X point and, you know, they need to check every six months for these software updates and do this and do that, right? That's something you can leave, whether it's a one-off project that you're handing, you know, handing back to a client, whether it's something you're leaving for a team member um, or for yourself. Um, in the many years that I have taught new developers that I've taught people how to program. Um, I have always uh, really stressed the importance of documentation as someone who, as a developer, um, has many times gone through the very, very trying experience of having to go back to code that I wrote some amount of time ago, didn't document well enough, and now I have no idea what it does or what's wrong. Um, so this is a higher level way to think about documentation for security related processes or things that have security implications um, that can just be written in plain language, um, but can really be an asset for engaging stakeholders and helping reduce those security risks over time. Uh, and that is all. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate, as I said, being able to speak to a group like this. Um, I appreciate the work that you do. Um, I just want to say thanks to Jess Kreider and um, Angel Ventev, who both helped give me a little bit of perspective for this talk. Um, that being said, all errors are my own. Um, and if we have time for a couple questions, if there are any, that would be great. Thanks again. Thank you, Susan.
So we have a question. And um, so what are, in your opinion, important elements of the message when a company publicly communicates a major security breach? So what they should include? Yeah, well, I think it, it I mean, <laughs> it depends. I mean, I think that first and foremost, um, you know, taking responsibility really matters. Um, acknowledging that a breach has happened um, and that there is going to continue to be, you know, regular and accurate communication about what the uh, risks and fallout might be, um, I think is really number one because, uh, you know, I, I think what's interesting about our culture today, because we have so many people, I mean, people who use so software and technology understand that things change, that, um, that you can't make, you know, kind of can't make promises. Um, but I think getting out in front of it really early and just saying, you know, we've learned of an incident, we've learned of a breach, um, you know, sharing what information you have and really ideally setting up a schedule and maybe a dedicated portal for um, when and how you're going to continue to provide information, right? You know, it could be as simple as getting up every week or writing a blog post every week and saying, this is what we know now. Um, and just people having that feeling that you are not trying to hide from it um, does a lot, I think, to enhance confidence. And that's part of the harm reduction is for people to feel, and obviously you should back this up by actually doing those things, um, but for people to actually feel like you are going to be honest with them, they're going to hear from you regularly about what you know, what you don't know, uh, and that you are not, because the longer you remain silent, even if you acknowledge it at first, the more, the more room there is for speculation that you're trying to hide something. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's just sort of like a simple communications thing. So that's what I would say is like, get out in front, take responsibility and, and communicate often. Yeah, so also other companies can learn from you, maybe, or so. Um, then, hmm. yeah, um, because you talked about uh, stakeholders' communication, we have a question on that. What else can be done if, even after suggesting it, stakeholders simply ignore the topic? Yeah, I mean, this is a hard one. Um, and I think that, I mean, I have been working with media organizations for ages on this. I think that um, this, is, this is the engagement part that's about listening, right? So when I talk to people who work in InfoSec and big companies, and some of them are in companies where um, people really take it seriously, and a lot of them are in companies where people really don't, um, is just making clear to your stakeholders that you see and understand what they need also, right? Most of us understand that security, when you don't have security, right? Adding security adds time, it adds effort, it adds complexity, it adds costs, right? Um, it is, if, if people feel like you're just there to tell them extra things they need to do, um, you are almost never going to get a warm reception. Um, really, engaging people and talking with them to understand what their pain points are in whatever their job role or ever, whatever their business objective is. What is it they need? What is important to them? Um, when I started looking at um, security in news organizations, because I had worked as a journalist, I had, you know, a leg up, I guess. Um, what I recognized was that Uh, culturally for journalists, source protection was, was considered paramount. As in, you had reporters who would tell you straight up, I will go to jail before I reveal a source. And so a lot of my early framing around security was, this is to protect your sources. Um, as one colleague once said, you know, like, you'll go to jail to protect a source, but you won't use Tor. Like, You have to find out what is important to the people that you are trying to engage and then think about how you can work with that and really reflect to them that you understand what they need and that you're trying to make your two sets of needs work together. 
So maybe a last question. Um, do you know a good example where the post-breach information was handled well? That's a really good question. And I, I, I honestly can't think of something off the top of my head. Um, in part because I think breaches happen so often. Um, I mean, I think what I can say is, for example, um, it, you know, I, this is gonna sound like an advertisement, but I have, I have a credit, like, I think actually the credit card industry, which has a lot of failings, um, does very well in this, in the sense that, um, They, they, they scan for fraudulent activity and they don't hold you responsible for bad charges, right? So it's not exactly a communication thing. I mean, a lot of them do have, they have a lot of tools where you can say, I want to know if a charge posts to my account over a certain dollar limit and you could set that to $10, right? They have a lot of tools that allow people to remain informed about what's going on with their accounts and their information. Um, And they are, they really don't push back for the most part, if you say this wasn't me. And I think there's, there's downsides to that because it means that fraud is essentially built into their business model. Right. Um, but at the same time, I think thinking about that, that kind of service that says, um, you know, again, how do we make this not disruptive, um, thinking about it in kind of a service model could be helpful. But yeah, I can't say that I have a great example of like a company super doing it right. I see. I'll think about that. <laughs> okay, Susan, thank you very much again for your talk. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a great... Uh, have a evening. nice day in New York. <laughs> It's lunchtime now, right? <laughs> so yeah, off to lunch, exactly. Awesome. Um, yeah. So thank so you again. and see you. Bye-bye.